Good morning. Thank you to the worship team uh, for leading us this morning. Guys, appreciate that um, meaningful time of worship together. I, uh, I came across this. Uh, a few years ago, there was a comedian. He might still be around. His name was Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, kind of his claim to fame was, uh, you might be a redneck if, or uh, you know you're a redneck if, right? So, so he did this kind of this spiel, and he had his stand-up bit. He probably still does it, because uh, there's a lot of rednecks in this world. And, uh, but this morning, I uh, want to start with this. This book, I think, trying to piggyback on the fame of Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, this book was put out a few years ago, You Might Be a Preacher If... You might be a preacher, can you, oh there, it's already up there, sorry. You might be a preacher if you've ever dreamed that you were preaching only to wake up and discover that you were. (laughs) It happens, right, love? It happens. There we go. You might be a preacher if you get your second wind when you say, and in conclusion, (laughs) that's when the real sermon starts. You might be a preacher if people sleep while you're talking getting used to that. You might be a preacher if your children want to be paid for any stories, references, or examples you gave about them in your sermons. <laughs> We're not quite at that point yet. You might be a preacher if a church picnic is no picnic. You might be a preacher if taking, oops, if taking a nap on a Sunday afternoon is a spiritual experience. You might be a preacher if the ideas you bounce off board members really do. (laughs) You might be a preacher if you've ever received an anonymous U-Haul gift certificate. (laughs) You might be a preacher if you've written a letter of resignation on a Monday. Add one. You might be a preacher if people ask you, so what do you do through the rest of the week? As we continue in our I Am a Church Member preaching series, I have to confess to you that uh, approaching the topic today was not easy. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was really uncomfortable, uncomfortable about this and uneasy about this. And uh, why is because the topic today is I will pray for my church leaders and specifically I will pray for my pastor And I'm going to be really honest with you. I thought about trying to trying to ship this one off to somebody else and and have them preach it for me. Because here's the thing: I just I just don't, in my sinful nature, and I have one. I don't feel comfortable asking and and focusing on myself and asking for for help and for prayer. That's my sinful nature talking, and, and it's at the root of that is pride. And I had to call it early on in the week because the bottom line is, as we just sang that perfect song, I, I need God, and I need your prayer to God for me. And our church leaders need your prayer for them. And then I got thinking about the Apostle Paul. And you just start leafing through the New Testament, and you realize that, man, a huge portion of the New Testament are Paul's prayer requests. That is Scripture. You know, we have our, our prayer bulletin we print up each week. It's, it's the prayer list of the Apostle Paul asking for prayer for his needs, asking for prayer for the needs of those he serves alongside and for the church. Just a few that come to mind. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Well, this is our series. I'm a little behind here. He says, finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may be spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. 
Here he's asking that he would be delivered from, from evil and wicked men. He's asking for protection here. We, we read this in Romans 15. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem might be acceptable to the saints there so that by God's will I might come to you with joy and together be refreshed. Again, Paul asks for their prayer for his protection and rescue from unbelievers so that he might be rejoined with them. But notice here that Paul says that by praying for him, God's people are actually joining in his struggle. And that's an important point this morning because the reality is that we are in a spiritual battle. We are at war with the spiritual forces of evil, with the devil himself. Which is why in Ephesians 6, Paul gives this very important exhortation to pray. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And then he goes on in verse 18, after explaining the armor, he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare, declare it fearlessly as I should. Do you see the theme there? Pray, pray. Pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Keep on praying for all the saints. Pray for me also, says Paul. If Paul needed prayer, oh, how much more do we? How much more do I? To stand firm in the ministry and fulfill God's calling, a pastor must not only be a person who prays themselves, be a man of prayer. He must have men and women of prayer in this congregation praying, praying for him, praying for his family, praying for the leadership of our church, for our deacons and their families. You see, if God's people don't pray specifically for their leaders, we will not have a healthy church. In his book, I'm a Church Member, Tom Rayner starts with a call to prayer for church leaders. Before he gets to the pastor, he, he has this little section just about church leaders because the, the point is this, the ministry of the church, the testimony of the church, the character of the church, the impact of the church is dependent upon the leadership of the church. So it is important that we pray for our leaders, pray for our leadership. And I'm so thankful that God has blessed Stanley Park Baptist Church with many godly leaders, faithful leaders. I think of our deacons, I think of our staff, I think of our worship leaders, I think of our committee leaders, I think of our youth and children's leaders, our, our, our teachers, our, our small group leaders, and, and every other leader in between. We are blessed here with that. And as Rainer puts it, very bluntly, all church leaders need prayer. 
The point is the church members must pray for our church leaders. So that's where I want to start. Please pray. Pray for our church leaders. Pray for Kevin Flad. He's the chair of our deacons board. For Ken Milmine, he's our, our chair, the assistant chair of our deacons board. For Brent Acorn, he's our, our moderator. Pray for all of our deacons, and you can see their pictures. You can meet them in the in, in cafe after. Pray for all of them. Pray for Peter Breka, who works with our youth. Pray, pray for he and his, his wife and, and their families, and pray for the families of all of our deacons. Pray, pray for our, our worship leaders who lead us faithfully Sunday mornings. Chelsea and Sean were leading us this morning. Laura Nova, Ken, Lisa, Mark, we, we have such an amazing team of leaders here. And I don't want to leave anyone out, but I know I will. So the point is pray for all of our leaders. They need prayer. Pray for protection. Pray that the the Lord would bless them and, and guard their families. Give them wisdom and faithfulness and endurance. Pray for them. Now, in the remainder of the chapter, Tom Rayner shifts to the pastor, the lead or senior pastor of the church. And he explains the importance of praying for your pastor according to the standards we find in the passage we read this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And if you want to open there, we're going to look at that for just a few moments this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes this letter to Timothy his, his beloved son, spiritual son in the faith. And at this point, it had been several years since Paul founded the church at Ephesus. So that the church had a strong start under Paul's leadership. He pastored there for three years. And during that time, the church became very important. In fact, through the church at Ephesus, all of the other churches in Asia Minor were founded. It, it was an important church. And Paul leaves. And after he leaves, things start to spiral out of control. And so years later, after being released from prison in Rome, Paul returns to Ephesus where he leaves Timothy to deal with the problems that had arisen in this church. And the problems all centered around, guess what? Leadership. Specifically, false leaders had come up in this church and were doing serious damage. That the church was was being torn apart by these false leaders who were teaching false doctrine, who, who were living ungodly lives, being terrible examples. And so in chapter 3 that we're going to look at here, Paul gives Timothy the, the, the fuel that he needs to attack the issue of false leadership. And he does that by laying out the qualifications that God has designed for church pastors, leaders, overseers, elders. We're going to see that's the word used here when we read in verse 1, here's a trustworthy saying, writes Paul, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, He desires a noble task. The term overseer here is the Greek word episkopos. And it's simply another title for minister, pastor, elder, bishop is sometimes used, though not in the Catholic sense. Those terms are used interchangeably throughout Paul's letters. And that's the leadership he has in view here when he writes that it's a noble task. Why is it a noble task? It's a big task. It's an important task. The the overseers, the pastors, the elders in the early church were to command and lead God's people in the way of salvation through the preaching and teaching of God's word, through prayer, through spiritual counsel. They would receive accusations against the people and have to determine if they were true. They would have to examine the people. They had to deal with their sins in short They were the shepherds of God's people. 
And for that reason, in the early church, pastors, elders, overseers were more prone to be persecuted. They were in the line of fire. Jesus said, Mark 14, you take out the shepherd, the sheep scatter. And the devil knows that. In light of the weight of these responsibilities, Tom Rainer, who was a pastor himself for many years and speaks from good experience, he says this, your pastor needs prayer. The life of a pastor is filled with mountaintops and valleys. He's adulated by some and castigated by others. He needs our prayers. And specifically, he goes on to talk about the importance of praying for the pastor's protection. Protection. In light of the battle that we read about in Ephesians 6, protection. And this really comes to light as we continue in this passage in 1 Timothy 3, when we see the next couple of verses here, Paul continues, he says, verse 2, Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Nancy read that for us earlier this morning, and there, you've heard it twice now. Look at verses 2 and 3. The overseer must be above reproach. Above reproach. You, you see, that, that's a big one. We're going to talk about that because really, above reproach kind of defines everything else that follows there. But what we see here is not a to-do list, is it? This is a to-be list. These are not duties based on performance. These are character qualities, virtue, godliness, spirituality, morality, self-control. This is who pastors are called to be. And like I said, it begins with that big one, that overarching Above reproach. It literally means to be above finding fault. You can't find fault if you are above reproach. You can't find fault with that person. It's also translated as unrebukable, blameless. And pastors are called to be above reproach. Verse 2 and 3 kind of go into some detail. The first thing he says is the husband of one wife. I love the translation. It literally means a one-woman man. Eyes for, for one woman. Mind thinking of only one woman. A body reserved for one woman. He must be temperate. That means alert. Alert. And it goes along with what happens next. He says self-controlled, which means having a, a controlled life through a disciplined, controlled mind, right? Because the mind is a battlefield. He goes on. He says he must be respectable. He must be hospitable, which means caring for, looking after strangers, he must be able to teach. He, he, that means he's got to have the gift and the passion of teaching and communicating God's word. He's got to be gentle, not violent, and free from the love of money. And all of that sums up what it means to be above reproach. Rayner puts it this way. While the pastor is certainly not expected to be perfect, 
He is to have a reputation above most everyone else. When people in the community speak or think about the pastor, the thoughts and words should be positive and encouraging. That's quite an expectation to hold. And just to add a little more pressure, his family must reflect a healthy Christian family. Do you see why church members must pray for their pastor's protection? It's often been said that that pastors and their families are a lot like fish living in a glass bowl. Everyone pays attention to see if the pastor and his wife ever have any friction, any arguments. They, they, They look at the kids. Are they well behaved? Are they really misbehaved? And, and here's the thing, that, that, that's, that's a tough, tall order, but it's understandable when we consider what Paul writes to Timothy in verses 3 and 4. And I got to tell you, these verses are challenging and convicting for me. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Rainer says, I've heard countless pastors worry about and struggle over their families. They worry that they neglect their families because of the demands of the church. They worry about their families living in a glass house. They anguish when critics direct barbs at family members. You get the picture. We are church members. We must be the prayer intercessors for pastors and their families. Few families face the kinds of pressures and expectations as the families of pastors. Pray for the pastor's family. And I just want to pause here because... I know you do. Many of you, I I know you do. And we are so thankful you do. Without your prayer, we're in a hard place. I'm sorry. All of this, if I can stop crying, is summed up in verse 7. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Here's the thing. Pastors need to be on their guards against the world, against the flesh, against the devil, which can subtly or not so subtly lure them away from serving the God they love. When Paul says outsiders in this verse, that refers to the unbelievers who are not part of the church. And so in this context, the verse means and mentions the devil's trap. Do you notice that? It's, it's a very interesting word here. Devil is the word diabolos, which means the chief slanderer, the accuser. That's the devil. And he's got all of his demons working for him. And he's real. He's not a, a, someone in our imaginations. The spiritual realm is very real. And the devil is at work, and he is powerful. But in a rare use of this word, Paul speaks of the devil's trap. Notice that, the devil's trap. And it's important that we understand the implications of that word, because a trap is something that is intentionally set, that that the devil has designed and put in place in order to catch the pastor or elder or overseer so that he's caught, so that he's trapped, so that he falls. Because again, you take out the shepherd, the sheep scatter. Which means that the devil sees the pastor as a threat. And one of his priorities then is to take him out, to take him down. And as we talked about with the family point, 
A quick way to do that, one is through family, but what we see in the context here is it's through his reputation. By damaging his reputation, sadly, we are, we are all too familiar with that kind of headline that we see, don't we? Another, yet another church leader, another pastor falls morally, a moral compromise, and, and that that list of casualties is, is growing every day. And it shouldn't surprise us when we understand how the devil works, when we understand and recognize his traps that are set for us, for the church, for pastors and leaders. We should be grieved by this. We should be heartbroken by this, and we need to pray. Rainer says, the devil is setting traps for pastors. Anything he can do to bring harm to the pastor's reputation, he will stop at nothing. Greed, adultery, anger, addiction, to catch the pastor in his trap. The devil is powerful, but God is so much more powerful. And God, in ways we don't always understand fully, works through the prayers of believers. We are church members. We will pray for the protection of our pastor and other church leaders. We will do all we can through prayer to keep our leaders out of the devil's trap. And I would ask that you pray specifically for that, for me, for our leadership today. In fact, I would ask that you commit us to prayer every day because we need that. Leaders in the church need that. Pastors need that. We rely upon that. On his website, and I just want to close with this, Rainer just gives. This is heavy on his heart. This is, he was a pastor and he's trying to minister to pastors and, and, and encourage the church to minister to their pastors. And so what he's done on his website is he's prov provided a list, a prayer list for your pastor. And I would add your church leaders as well. But here's what it looks like. Rainer says, we all need prayer. We all need to pray. Pastors specifically need prayer. The enemy, enemy will do whatever he can to destroy the ministry of your pastors. Will you consider praying for your pastors in these specific areas? Number one, pray for wisdom for your pastor. These leaders are often confronted with incredibly challenging situations, decisions. They need God's wisdom to continue to be the leader of the church God has called them to be. They need wisdom to know what to preach and teach and how to present God's word. In, in their sermons. Number two, pray for your pastor's protection. Your pastor will be attacked in so many different ways. Your pastor will be tempted again and again. The enemy seeks to destroy. The enemy wants your pastor's ministry destroyed. And I'll add, he wants the church destroyed. Number three, pray for your pastor's family. They too are attacked, criticized, sometimes bullied. They often feel isolated and alone. They need encouragement. They need prayer. Pray for your pastor to withstand critics and bullies. Some of the critics and bullies are overt and aggressive. Others are passive aggressive. All are painful. Every pastor has them. Pray against discouragement from comparison. Before this week is over, a church member will likely tell your pastor to listen to a podcast by another pastor to learn how to really preach. <laughs> Actual words spoken to a pastor. Other pastors will hear numerous comments about other great church in the community. The message is real and painful. You don't measure up, pastor. Pray against the discouragement from members leaving. It's hard for your pastor not to take it personally. It's really hard when the departing member tells your pastor to take it personally. Number seven, pray against discouragement from decline. Two out of every three congregations in North America are declining. That is a painful reality for your pastor. Pray. Pray against discouragement from disunity. I wish I had every minute back I had to spend refereeing church members. Those are the actual words of one of the church answer one of the church answers pastors I served. The enemy loves it when church members fight one another. Pray for discernment for yes and no. 
Pastors are pulled in a multitude of directions. They're expected to be in so many meetings, so many social events, so many pastoral situations. They're really expected to be omnipresent. Pray that they would be able to say no more often. Pray for their families who often get the the scanty leftovers of the pastor's time. Number 10, pray for financial pressures. Many pastors are underpaid. I'm not complaining here. They struggle day by day with financial challenges. Actual quote from a deacon, I like for our pastor to be underpaid. It keeps him humble and dependent on God. That deacon is enjoying a life of leisure from inherited wealth. Eleven, pray for gospel opportunities. Pastors are energized when they have opportunity to share the gospel. Unfortunately, many of them are too busy to take time to do so. That's tragic. The demands of the church are just too great. These pastors live lives of inverted priorities and frustrating days. Do we really want healthy churches, he says? Do we really want to defeat the enemy in these battles? Pray for your pastor. Start today. Take five minutes of each day to pray for your pastor. It might be the greatest contribution you can make to your church. The fourth pledge, I'm not going to read, and I'm not going to ask you to stand, and I'm not going to ask you to repeat it with me. It's in your bulletins. I would ask for those who are willing, and again, thank those who already are, but if you're willing to pray specifically, not only for me, I would add for Pastor Peter with our youth, for for our leadership, I mentioned Kevin and and Ken and our deacons, For, for our church leaders. You start with five minutes a day, like Rainer suggests, but all of a sudden, man, that that can get extended when when we realize we've got a lot of people we need to be lifting up in prayer. And I know we've got a wonderful campaign called Pray For Me, which is already going on. You can add this in, make it a part of it. Paul says, pray without ceasing. And one day before I die, I I pray that I can be close to that. But this is a good way to move in that direction. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for us? Would you pray for my family? Would you pray for our leadership and their families? We are all in the line of fire, and we need the prayer support of God's people. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this word. God, I thank you for for this word from 1 Timothy 3. Lord God, for, for the reminder personally for me of, of what this calling means, but Father, for the blessing of being a part of your people here who do pray for me and pray for my family and pray for our leaders and pray for their families. Father, I thank you for that support, and I pray that you would set your hedge of protection around Stanley Park Baptist Church. Father, we know that the devil's snares are set all around us, He hates us. He wants to see this place and every church like it fall. But Father God, you are almighty. I pray, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit and your living word and obedience to it, that you would give us wisdom so that we would sidestep those traps, Father God, so that we would know what to say and what not to say. Father, I pray that you'd Guard us from temptation and deliver us from evil for the sake of your name, for the sake of your kingdom, so that Stanley Park Baptist Church and its leaders would lead as you have called us to, Father God, by your Spirit into the future that you have for us, Father, that you would grow the ministry here and in in other churches as well, we pray, Father God. Thank you for the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church, Lord. And so I pray that today we would be faithful and, God, we would be as people who pray without ceasing, praying for the leaders you've given us. And I thank you for each one of them, God. I pray for my fellow leaders, for, for our deacons, God, for their families, I pray for our worship leaders and their families. I pray for all of our leaders leading in so many different capacities. Guard and protect them, I pray. Father, I pray today that they would know your joy as their strength in serving you by serving this church. And I ask these things in the strong, saving name of Jesus.